Welcome. In this lecture, we're going to learn about cells. So, you know, a lot of times we may ask, well, you know, what is a cell? And I've done this before with students, and I had, I just said, okay, draw a cell. And these were the, the outcomes that I got. One was just a circle, one was a circle with another circle, and then apparently some chromosomes in the inside, and then one with a circle, and then lots of other stuff on the inside, right? But what's the common element here among all three is this, this, this circle on the outside, which represents the cell membrane or the plasma membrane. Now I want to teach you a little bit about how this membrane is important and how it serves as um, a barrier between what's on the outside and what's on the inside. But it's only selectively permeable to some things. So some things can go through it, this, these membranes and some things can't. To demonstrate this, um, initially we're going to look at potatoes in water. Okay, so we're going to do an experiment where we're going to look at pure potato slices in pure water and in salt water. All right, so what we can see here is we've got our salt water and we have our fresh water. And we let the potato slices soak for an hour. Okay, now we're going to go in and uh, pull these out and, and see what the potato is like. So here's the potato, and if, I, if this person tries to break it, it doesn't take too long and it snaps right in half. It's nice and rigid and crisp. Let's see though what happens with the salt water. So we pull this one out. We do the same type of thing where we try to break it in half. And it's all rubbery and flexible and not rigid and not crisp. In fact, it's even hard for them to break it. So something's different going on. Let's talk about what that is. Okay, so something is different, right, between what's happening in the salt and the pure water. And to understand this, it has to do with, with that membrane around the outside of cells. So to understand this, we've got to understand the microstructure of membranes. And to do this, we first need to look at what are called phospholipids. A phospholipid is composed of two parts. It has this phosphate head this, that's, that's a hydrophilic head. Hydro means water and philic means loving, so this part is water loving, and then hydrophobic tails, okay? And these, um, um, this is like the actual structure, you know, the chemical makeup of a single polyphospholipid. Uh, but if you put a bunch of these together, they form this mat of phospholipids, a layer. And if it's in water, you can form a bilayer because the, the hydrophilic heads always want to go towards the water. So on both ends, they're going towards the water. And then on the inside, the hydrophobic fatty acid tails face each other and there's essentially, there's like no water in, in between here, right? No water molecules. Now, these um, phospholipid can behave differently as well in water and in oil. So like if you've got an oil slick, you know, this they can cause that division between the water and the oil. Um, you can trap oil on the inside or you can have, you know, a, a bilayer bubble as well. And across this membrane, water can freely move. Water molecules can go from one side of the bilayer membrane to the other side um, f uh, freely. And and water moves in relation to concentration gradients. So if there is a high concentration gradient of solutes, water moves towards that high concentration gradient of solutes to try to even out the total, the concentration gradients on both sides of a membrane. So let's look at the middle, so the middle situation here. This is called an isotonic solution, where the number of particles, or the, I'm sorry, the concentration of particles on the outside of the membrane is equal to the concentration of particles on the inside of the membrane. So there's no net movement of water. But if the concentration is higher on the outside of the membrane, then there is a water will go out of the cell. And if, you're, if the um, solution is hypotonic, then that means there are more particles, more solutes on the inside of the, of the cell, of the cellular membrane, and so therefore water will rush into the cell. Besides water, other molecules can also cross the membrane. For example, here we can see that carbon dioxide and oxygen can freely cross the, the plasma membrane or the cellular membrane, and they they move from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. This is called simple diffusion. 
You could also have facilitated diffusion, where larger molecules or charged molecules that cannot freely pass, excuse me, that cannot freely pass through the membrane, they must pass through a channel or through a tube or through an opening, a tunnel. And there are proteins that are embedded within the membrane that serve this purpose. They allow these larger molecules or charged molecules to freely flow from one side of the membrane to the other based on the concentration gradient. So they flow from areas of high concentration to low concentration, and this is called facilitated diffusion. Finally, there is um, also a form of moving molecules across a membrane called active transport. And this is where molecules move from an area of high concentra or low concentration to an area of high concentration, so against the concentration gradient. In order to do this, it requires energy. So here's an example of this protein right here that has a particular shape and that can have these sodium ions dock on this protein. Then an ATP molecule, this A with three P's comes in, it binds here, one of these phos uh, phosphorus molecules are cleaved off, and that allows the protein to use that energy and to change its shape. And as the protein changes its shape, it can then throw those sodium ions onto the other part of the membrane. So it's moving molecules from a low concentration to a high concentration against the concentra concentration gradient. And typically this is done with a protein that requires energy and, and, it, and it physically, in a sense, is moving these things or it can pump things to the other side. So this is a, uh, a summary of, the th of these different ways. So here's osmosis, where water um, moves from a low solute concentration to a higher solute concentration, or in other words, the water concentration is higher, and so it moves to where there's a lower water concentration relative to the solutes. And again, that can happen freely across the membrane. Diffusion, uh, simple diffusion, is where you have molecules that move across the membrane from higher to lower concentrations. And facilitated diff diffusion, remember, requires um, the use of a protein that opens up a channel so that these solutes can then flow from high to low concentrations. And all of this requires no energy, it is passive transport. Active transport requires energy, and so there, here's this protein that requires some energy, and you move um, solutes from a lower concentration to a higher concentration. Now I also want to just talk about what the last type of tr transportation that can happen at a cellular level, where you have if you want to get um, move a bunch of molecules outside of the cell all at once, you can make you can form a vesicle, and then the vesicle fuses with the membrane, the cellular membrane or plasma membrane, and then all of these molecules can then be released um, outside of the cell. In a likewise manner, you can also gather up lots of molecules that are on the outside of the cell, put them into a vesicle, and bring them into the cell, and then process them. Now, cells, in addition to this outer membrane, also have lots of other organelles. Here are some of the most um, common ones that you've probably heard of before. The nucleus, right? This is what houses the DNA. Ribosomes, these are structures that aid in protein synthesis, and we'll learn more about those in detail later. Mitochondria, these break down sugar for, uh, and make uh, energy, ATP. Chloroplasts, they manufacture sugar from sunlight and carbon dioxide, so chloroplasts are the things that carry out photosynthesis. If we return to our diagrams of kind of some simple cells, here is the diagram of a prokaryotic or bacterial cell. Notice it does not have a nucleus. It does have DNA in kind of just this nucleoid region, but there's no nucleus, and they do have ribosomes. Then you have the plasma membrane, and in this case there's a cell wall and even a capsule on the outside. If we look at an idealized animal cell, we see that the animal cells have a nucleus. They have a Golgi apparatus. They have this rough and smooth endoplasmic reticulum. They have ribosomes. They have uh, a mitochondria. They have um, a cytoskeleton. And um, these three structures are not present in plant cells, a centriole, lysosomes, and flagellum. Plant cells, um, on the other hand, have a central vacuole, a cell wall, and chloroplasts, which are not found in animal cells. But plant cells also have mitochondria, a nucleus, rough and smooth endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, and so forth. <laughs> now I want to just remind ourselves of something that I think we've talked about before. Um, 
and that is the origin of how we made eukaryotic cells, but and also the origin of these two um, organelles that we just talked about briefly, mitochondria and chloroplasts. In the um, in in the theory of endo of endosymbiosis, an early ancestral prokaryotic cell began to have lots and lots of membrane enfolding and. And again, this is taken millions of years, okay? But we're showing kind of over millions of years, you end up with a cell that starts to have these compartmentalizations due to these these now inner membranes. So there's a, there's this system of inner membranes. In some cases, this became the nucleus. The, I'm sorry, the nuclear envelope, the membrane that surrounds the nucleus. Further along this, the evolutionary track of a eukaryotic cell. Um, aerobic heterotrophic prokaryotes. So these are bacteria that can take energy, sugar, and process them very efficiently to make lots of energy. These were incorporated in an endosymbiotic relationship with kind of one of these early eukaryotic cells. Over millions of years, that bacteria eventually becomes the mitochondria. Also, the pro, uh, a photosynthetic prokaryote that can carry out photosynthesis began a relationship and over millions and millions and millions of years you end up eventually with a chloroplast. So mitochondria and chloroplast used to be bacteria. What's interesting is that mitochondria and chloroplast also have their own DNA. So there is a mitochondrial genome and a chloroplast genome and then there's the nuclear genome. And if we were to take the DNA from each of these different cells from say a corn plant we could, we could test whether indeed mitochondria and chloroplasts did come from bacteria or whether the DNA inside of here and therefore this structure came from just, you know, the DNA from, from the nucleus. And we can do that by again making a tree. When we do this, we see that chloroplasts, chloroplast DNA from corn, which is the um, species Z maize, nests right over next to other cyanobacteria and the mitochondrial DNA also is most closely related to other bacteria whereas if we come over to this side here is corn that, it, that is um, being related to other eukaryotes and that's because this is based on the the DNA from the nucleus so this is a good test showing that indeed the mitochondria and the chloroplast were once bacteria and that through a process of endosymbiosis and then millions and millions of years of evolution they essentially just become organelles. So to, to summarize all of this we and if we compare and contrast bacteria, virus, animals and plant cells we see that only bacteria, animal and plant cells have cell membranes. Only bacteria and plant cells can have a cell wall. All of them have DNA only animals and plant cells have a nucleus and mitochondria and, on, and only bacteria, animal and plant cells have ribosomes. Only plant cells have chloroplasts and again everything but virus have cytoplasm. So this is a, another reason why when you look across here virus are lacking everything except for DNA and so this is another reason why we don't count viruses as being alive. So that's a quick intro to cells.